started lecturing on chapter 13. Uh, again, uh, these notes are up on our uh, Canvas page. Make sure as well in the chat box, looks like you're doing it there. Make sure you put here for roll as well. We'll get started here in just a sec again. Uh, lecture notes up there on Canvas and we're gonna start on chapter 13, which should be equilibrium. <clears throat> Just move some stuff around here. Okay, uh, as we go through, uh, you know, like we talked about last time, if you have questions, you're more than welcome to uh, unmute yourself and ask a question. You're also welcome if you'd like to rather uh, <clears throat> ask a question in the chat box there. Uh, you know, I'll be happy to answer that as well when I see it. And um, you hopefully should be able to see the lecture notes there on your screen. And uh, before we get started, though, is there any questions on, I guess, anything about the class or anything like that? Anybody thought of or anything like that? Uh, professor, yeah. Did you uh, think about the what you're gonna do with the homework? Are you gonna make it so we can? I I, I, th I think I'm gonna keep the homework the way uh, I have it, which is again, uh, you know, uh, you get kind of what you get, and you know, you might lose a little if you give maybe a wrong answer or something like that. But I think I'm gonna leave it the way. It, uh, it is this time for this semester. I've done it both ways over the years. You know, I've done like, you know, you get 85% correct, you get it right, all full credit and stuff like that. And I've done it this way. So I think as of now, I'm going to kind of leave it the way it is. And we're going to go kind of that way with the homework and stuff like that. Again, I believe it should be say you get multiple opportunities. And again, you know, it's computer wise. So I think they take some weird percentage, maybe if you give some wrong answer or something like that um, along the way and stuff like that. So as it stands now, I think I'm going to keep it that way. <clears> hey, <throat> okay, thank you. You're welcome. Other questions? Okay. All right. Uh, so we're gonna get started as well. Um, hopefully you saw or the announcement as well. Uh, we talked about some, you know, um, topics that were sort of important, and we'll kind of see a little bit as we go through uh, this uh, semester as well. From one A, I put like a module up, which is some little. I want to call them worksheets, little combo worksheets, sort of background information on some, you know, important topics and stuff like that. And again, we'll, we'll see some of those things. So uh, hopefully you had an opportunity to look at it. if you haven't and you have some questions on things um, like that, make sure you kind of go and look at those as well. That should hopefully help as well as we go through it. <clears throat> okay, uh, so let us get started. Uh, the recordings for lectures and stuff will be posted on, on Canvas. Um, I didn't really post the last one because it was just about the syllabus. So <laughs> I imagine nobody wants to listen to that again. Um, so starting with this one, uh, they will be up there. Uh, probably, I don't know how quickly, but uh, you know, within a day or so, the it should hopefully be up there, the link and stuff like that for you to rewatch it if you like and stuff. Okay. Um, then let us get started then on our first chapter, which is equilibrium and equilibrium really is also sort of the uh, big topic of, of really the semester here. Um, it really from now through maybe the middle, even a little bit after the middle of the class, it is the major sort of thing that we will talk about. We'll talk about every single type of equilibrium that you want to, don't want to know. Um, we'll get into pretty much everything. So in this chapter here, we're just going to start with sort of basic equilibrium and chemical equilibrium and sort of what that means. So let's get started with that. So equilibrium itself um, <clears throat> really involves, when we talk about it sort of in, in chemistry here, it does involve a, a certain type of reaction that you probably have seen before. And it's a reaction such as something like this, say A plus B goes to C plus D. And what we different about this reaction is really these arrows, right? So these arrows imply that it's a reversible reaction. So really chemical equilibrium involves a lot of reversible reactions. And when we see arrows heading in both directions, it basically means that 
There is the forward direction, which is heading towards the products, right? right? These are our reactants over here, right? Just to remind everybody, right? This is our products, hopefully. So going in that sort of forward direction as reactants go to products, uh, that is again, what's sort of indicated as the forward direction, the reversible reaction. Heading in the opposite direction where our products can sort of recombine and make some of our reactants back. That is what is sometimes referred to as the reverse direction. And when we talk about sort of reaching chemical equilibrium, what we're talking about is in this type of reaction, the rate of the forward reaction will equal the rate of the reverse reaction. So that is oftentimes something that people mess up on in terms of equilibrium is they think about equilibrium. They think when something reaches sort of chemical equilibrium, what that means is I have like the exact same amount of everything on both sides. So I have the exact same reactants, exact same amount of products. And that's really not the case. When we talk about again, reaching equilibrium, we're not really talking about, hey, you got five of these reactants and five of these products, the exact same amount on both sides. We're actually talking about the rate. And what we're talking about is the rate of that forward reaction will eventually equal the rate of the reverse reaction. So basically just as fast as it goes from reactants to products, it will head back the other way just as fast going from products back to reactants. And ultimately what that means is, although we don't necessarily end up with the same amount on both sides, what that means is when something does reach chemical equilibrium, we basically will lock everybody into place in terms of their concentrations, their pressures, whatever it may be. So for example, if we say we had say four molar this guy, three molar this guy, two molar that guy, and say four molar this guy. If we reach chemical equilibrium at that point when these guys have these concentrations, what that means is they will maintain those concentrations and they really won't change all that much as it remains in chemical equilibrium. So just as quick it goes to products, comes back, and ultimately what you get is everybody just sort of stays where they're at at that point uh, because of that situation. Also because of that, when we look at something, for example, if we had a beaker sitting in front of us of a reaction that has reached equilibrium, we may look at it and go, well, it doesn't look like much is happening there. Maybe it was a red in color, it become colorless at that point and just kind of sitting there. And it may look like, oh, the reaction is done. There's not much happening, but there actually is a lot happening to maintain it. So on the big level, the macroscopic level, we look at equilibrium as not much is happening, but on the small scale, the microscopic scale, there's a lot of activity that's happening and it's just sort of happening at the same rate going back and forth and it's keeping everybody where it's at. So sometimes people, when they sort of look at something think, oh, well, the reaction's over, it's reached equilibrium, there's nothing happening. But if you were to sort of super zoom in on sort of what's happening on the molecular level, you would see a lot of activity. You see reactants going to product, products going to reactants back and forth. Again, it's just that rate at which that is happening is the same. And that causes really everybody to be able to maintain where they're at at that point. So one very big sort of misconception that a lot of people have when we talk about sort of you know, this reactions at equilibrium or reach equilibrium. Sometimes people think equilibrium equal, everybody's the same on both sides. And again, that's not really what we're talking about uh, in this particular case. Any questions on that? Yeah. Sir, could I ask a question? Yeah. Um, what's the difference between static and dynamic? Uh, so static means like nothing much is happening. So everything's just gonna stain is done sort of dynamic means there's a lot of stuff sort of happening okay yeah. um so like when you were talking about a and b um and the reversible reaction to c and d when they like because of that reversible reaction is it causing it to be more static because of that because like they're both kind of going back and forth is that no, so basically what it was sort of referring to is when we do some award winning drawing here. So um, let's just say we did a, a, re a reversible reaction like this. And let's just say like this reaction started 
say with some color here, right? And then at some point the reaction takes place and it ends up the beaker kind of looking like uh, my drawing here on the right, where it's say colorless and stuff like that. If you were to just to look at that beaker, for example, on the right, it may just look to you like there's like nothing happening, right? Everything's just done, it's over, the reaction is completely done, right? It obviously started say with a colored solution, it ended up colorless at the end, clearly the reaction is happening. And that's what it means sort of on the microscopic, uh, macroscopic level, the big level, if you just kind of look at the big beaker sitting on the, on the desk, it looks like, hey, it's all done. There's nothing happening at all. If you were to actually like kind of super zoom in, what you would see in this particular case is it's actually a lot of stuff happening. You got A and B continuously going this way. You got C and D continuously going this way. If you were like able to kind of super zoom in and see all the little sort of molecules, you know, reacting and stuff like that, there's a lot of activity that's happening. So that's what it means. Sometimes when we think about chemical equilibrium, we oftentimes think about reactions and look at reactions, say in beakers, test tubes, stuff like that. And at some point we look at it and go, oh, it's done. It's over, right? And there's nothing happening. And that's what it means by it's static. We think of it as being sort of static when we kind of look at it on the big scale. But again, if we were to sort of super zoom in where all the molecules are reacting with each other, there's actually a lot of activity to allow it to be able to maintain sort of that colorless look at this point where it looks like nothing's happening. But there's a lot of activity that's continuously happening at this point of reactants going to products, products going to reactants. Okay, that makes more sense. Thank okay. you. You're welcome. Other questions on that? Okay. And screen wise, it looks okay, normal size. Doesn't look super small. All right. All right. So if we look at a reaction such as this one here, which is obviously some N2 uh, plus some H2 going to NH3, do some balancing. When we start this reaction, we pretty much have all reactants present. As we can see here, we have H2, we have N2, and we pretty much got nothing here of our products. Now, in order for this reaction really to take place, the Ford reaction has to kind of start first, right? So we have to kick off that Ford reaction, in this case, of the N2 plus the H2 going to NH3. And what we see in terms of the graph is in order to do that, we have to use up some of our H2, which is a reactant. We have to use up some of our N2, which is a product. And what we end up seeing is we start to see an increase in the amount of product that is going to be made. So at some point here, as the forward direction predominates, we're going to start producing some product. And at some point, what's going to happen is we're going to get enough product that's been made that the reverse reaction could actually start to occur at this point. And we could get some of that product to actually come back and make some reactants. And this process will continue. And that's why we kind of see a, a steep decrease in our reactants to begin with. Then it sort of levels out as we continue on here with our reactants in terms of how much is being used. And we do see sort of a big increase, if you will, in our product formation at the beginning it also starts to sort of level out as time goes on. And at some point, what we will see is like right about here for all of our guys here, our reactants and our products, we see that basically everybody has plateaued out. And at the point where all these guys basically hit a plateau and are flatlined, what that means is, and my very bad drawing here, is in this graph, if the line obviously remains straight, that means we're not making anymore, we're not losing anymore, it's being able to maintain where it's at in terms of its concentration. And what we see is the H2, the N2, and our products, our NH3, actually are able to maintain their concentrations. And that's the point where chemical equilibrium has been reached, where we see everybody's lines in a graph such as this basically level out. And that means at that point we have achieved, and in this case is sort of where the dotted line is, the rate of the forward reaction will equal the rate of the reverse reaction. So again, just as quickly as it goes in one direction, it's going back in the other direction. And that's essentially gonna allow everybody to basically lock themselves in to their concentrations where they're at. Any questions on that?
So for example, if we look at <clears throat> this reaction here of some water plus some carbon monoxide making some H2 and CO2, initially here we have no water or C, I'm sorry, no H2 or CO2, no products being made there are present. But as the reaction starts, it is safe to assume that pretty much it's gonna head in that forward direction. As soon as we start to get some of these guys, we will get that reverse direction also happening. And again, at some point we will get, as it says here, and as we just talked about a number of times, when we talk about equilibrium, we will get that equal rate happening of the forward and reverse direction. And that again is what we mean when we have reached chemical equilibrium. And again, just graphically, if you ever see a graph sort of describing equilibrium, that's essentially what you're looking for is where everybody levels out. And at that point where everybody levels out, that is when uh, equilibrium basically has been reached. So for example here, let's take a moment here. Let's think about what would happen if we look at this equilibrium and we decided we're going to add more H2O to this flask. Think about what will happen to everybody here. So what will happen to the concentration? By the way, when we use these little brackets, that is concentration, right? And usually molarity we're talking about. So what will happen sort of to the concentration of everybody here if we had this reaction happening in a flask and we decided to add more water to it? So take a moment or two, just think to yourself there what you think would happen to each of those things there. Will their concentrations go up? Will their concentrations go down? Will they remain the same? So take a second and think about it and we'll talk about it here. Okay, so let's talk about this. So in this particular reaction, we want to know what will happen if we add more H2O to it. So let's start off with <clears throat> what will happen to our products. How about H2? Will we make more, less, or will it be the same? So hopefully, you know that it should actually increase in this case. Why should it increase? Well, when I add more water to this side, it is basically going to allow the forward reaction basically to kick off. It's going to create more water that's available to react with CO, which means they are going to be able to react a lot quicker, a lot easier. And again, that should kick off in this particular instance that forward reaction to occur. And if that forward reaction is kicked off, that means we're going to be making more products, right? And if we're making more products, since our H2 is a product, we would expect it to increase. Our CO2 should also increase. What about our CO? Should it go up, down? The amount of CO in this particular case should go down in this case. Remember, in order for that forward reaction to take place, both of these reactants has to come together to make our products. So we would expect the CO actually to decrease as this reaction basically proceeds. Now, the last one here, which is water, is an interesting one. It will actually probably go up. And it will go up because you added it, right? So obviously, it's going to go up. But then what you should start to see is as the forward reaction takes place, you should start to see it come back down. It may actually end up being higher than it started with because again, you artificially added it. But the trend you probably should see with the water is it should kind of go up. And then as it starts reacting with the CO, it should start to come back down and start to form products. Any questions on any of that? Um, yeah, I have another question. Sorry. Um, so if you are adding more water to it, wouldn't it be diluting it more, which would cause like reactions to be slower possibly, or is, am I not thinking the right? It, it wouldn't in this case, although this is water, this is also water in the gas state. So it's actually steam, right? So these are basically water molecules that are, when you're in the gas state, right? Those are things with the most energy they're moving around They're you know, uh, kind of flying around and stuff like that. So in this particular case, it actually won't 
diluted in that sense that um, it will still actually react with the CO and, and cause that forward reaction to take place. Other okay, thank you. Yeah, that makes more sense, sorry. No worries. Other questions? Can you explain why CO goes down again? Yeah, so basically, um, let me find somewhere here to draw my, I'll just draw it here. So what we're thinking about, you know, we basically have, uh, in this case, uh, it was some water flowing around, right? We have some CO, we have some H2 in this container, CO2. Basically, we have all this in here, right? And the combination of these two things, right, will go and make our products, right, which are down here. So when we add more of this water, it's going to make a lot more waters available. I'll just use my circles. And because those waters are available, they're going to want to find the CO and start reacting. So once these guys start reacting, it's going to start forming the products that are in this container. And the only way that we could form the products is right in a reaction, all of our reactants basically break apart. They reassemble as these guys, right? And because of that, that's gonna cause the CO concentration to decrease because we got to use some of that CO to produce, maybe not the H2, but the CO2 probably in this case, um, as our product. So we will start to see that go down. And we do see the water initially rise only because we artificially kind of threw it in there. But we will also see the same trend for the other reactant, the water, it will also start to come back down as it starts reacting with the CO. So as these guys come together, we should start to see some decreases in each of those reactants basically happening. The only difference with the water aspect of it is uh, it actually might even end up higher than it started with because it was artificially added by you. So you artificially added it, which made it jump really high, but it will then eventually start working its way back down. And again, it, it may actually end up higher than it started with because of that. Okay, Other, thank you. You're welcome. Other questions? Okay, so we talked about that. So while we look at this one, same reaction, but think about what would happen if we added H2 in this case. So take a moment or two, think about what happens to everybody if we add H2 in this case. A product in this case. And just by doing that, that's going to again make H2 more available to CO2. And what that's going to kick off in this particular case is actually the reverse reaction happening. That's going to kick off basically this reaction happening going from products to reactants. Again, the greater availability of that H2 is going to react with the CO2, going to force the reaction basically to the left in this case. What that means is in terms of our reactants, we're going to actually see an increase happening for both of these reactants as we should be making more reactants in this case as the reverse reaction takes place, which means basically our products are breaking down to make more reactants on the other side heading in this direction. What that means for our CO2 is because that is needed to make our reactants in this case, we would expect it to go down Lastly, much like the water in the first example here, we would most likely see the H2 increase because we added it. But as soon as it starts reacting with the CO2, we should start to see it come back down. And again, you may be in the same situation as with the water in the first example. It may actually end up being a little bit higher than it started with because of you artificially adding it. it may actually end up lower than it started with, but so a little hard to for sure tell on the H2. But again, here in this case, the CO2 would go down because it's basically causing the reaction to head towards the reactant side. Any question on that one? Okay. <clears throat> so that's our thing that we looked at earlier. So let's talk about actually sort of some relationships that we see that involve equilibrium. So if we look at this particular reaction here, there is a relationship that you can have from a reversible reaction, and that is K. And in this particular case, K would equal the concentration of our NO2 squared over the concentration of our N2O4. Again, a reminder, as I mentioned just a minute ago, the brackets mean concentration. And usually when we're talking about concentration, that is molarity. 
which is moles per liter. So what is this? This is the equilibrium constant. And it is capital K, and that's kind of important. Uh, lowercase k is uh, the rate constant we'll talk about at the end of the semester. So capital K here is the equilibrium constant. And really it is, for the most part, products, the concentration of products divided by the concentration of the reactants. We will also see here, as we can see in this case, the coefficients in the balance equation is important. That becomes the exponent. So that's where the two comes from is the coefficient. So the concentration of NO2 divided by the concentration n 204 equals this number. Number is not that important for now. This is what is sometimes referred to as Kc because this is concentration of each of these, C for concentration. And in general, you could write the equilibrium expression such as this. We basically take our products divided by our reactants. We do use the coefficients as the exponents. And this gives us a value that is a constant value, hence the name equilibrium constant. It is a constant value for a couple of things, which is really important to remember as we go through all this. It is a constant value for the equation as it's written. So exactly how you see that equation, it is a constant value for it. It is also constant for that particular temperature. Temperature is the only thing that will actually affect the value of the equilibrium constant. What that means is this, it means that if you have a reaction, says so is what we have here, A plus B goes to C plus D. And if we keep the temperature, say at 25 degrees Celsius, and you started with five molar this guy, four molar this guy in one experiment, you did another experiment where you started with two molar this guy and three molar this guy. No matter what will happen at 25 degrees, as long as the temperature remains the same, the K value will be the same, it will be constant. So just for example, I made up this number, not the right number, just made it up. Let's just say for that example, at 25 degrees Celsius, it comes to 14. Now, if you change the temperature to say 50 degrees Celsius, and you start to say with five molar of A and four molar of B, two molar of A and three molar of B, the equilibrium constant value will change from 25 degrees, and we'll say the K is 25 in this particular case. As long as you keep the temperature at 50 degrees, you can start with different amounts of everybody. When that thing reaches equilibrium, it will always reach the same proportion of products to reactants and give you the same number. So that's a very important sort of aspect of it. Sometimes people feel like, hey, if I did this reaction and I started with say five and four of A and B, and then change it to two and three, how could I end up with the same value of K? And it just comes that way, always the proportion of products to reactants, as long as you do not change the temperature, no matter how much of everybody you start with, will always come to the exact same ratio of products versus reactants and end up the same. The only difference is if you change the temperature, that ratio will change and the K value between 25 degrees and 50 degrees will be different values. But once you hit 50 degrees, it will stay the same all the way through. It won't change again, unless you change the temperature again. So those are two really important things. And we'll talk more about it as well as we continue on. But the K value that you see sort of displayed for a reaction or equation is really specific for exactly the way that reaction is written, what are the reactants, what are the products. And as long as you do not change the temperature, you could start with whatever amount of everybody in that reaction, it will always end up at the exact same sort of point uh, when the rate of the forward reaction equals the rate of the reverse reaction, and you'll end up with the same value of K. Any questions on that?
Um, on the slide underneath constant, you wrote equation something it's written. What yeah. what does that say? It says uh, is the value of k is always going to be the same number and is specific for exactly the way the equation is written. So the equation as it's written and it's for that specific temperature. Other questions? Um, I have a question. Yeah. Um, for kc equals, is that, does that also mean equilibrium constant or is it like k equals? Because it says kc and then on the bottom it says like k equals. Yeah, so k in general, and we'll see this throughout the semester, capital K in general, Badly written K there, try that again. Capital K, <clears throat> that represents the equilibrium constant. There are lots and lots of different equilibrium constants. One sort of type of equilibrium constant is what is referred to as KC. And the C means that you're going to calculate it based on the concentrations of everybody. There's one, as we will see, which is known as KP. KP stands for pressure, which means instead of molarities here, you would use something like atmospheres and pressures of gases. There's one that you probably have seen before in Chem 1A, Chem 3, that is KW, right? KW is the equilibrium constant of water. And um, that's what the W stands for. There's KA, KB, KSP, KF. There's a ton of K values. Pretty much the entire class here is all about the different types of K values. But all K values, no matter what the little sort of letter is at the bottom, they're all really the same thing. They're all basically this relationship of the products over the reactants. Other questions? Okay, so <clears throat> that's the same thing. So what does it mean if we have a value of K? So one important thing about K is, one nice thing is it's really just a number. So this is really just a number after probably being yelled at all through your chemistry career about units, 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 there's actually no units associated with K usually. So usually we don't associate uh, any type of units involved with K. It is really just a number. So what does that number really tell us? Well, if you just think about it sort of logically that K is essentially our products divided by our reactants. If I have a really large value of K, what that means is when this reaction reaches equilibrium, if I have a large value of K, I would expect me to have products basically present. So if you just think about it math wise, if you take a large number on top divided by a small number, you will get a large number. So you'll have mainly products that are involved at that point. And if you have a small little value of K, that mainly means that you will have reactants present when you reach equilibrium. Again, math-wise, same deal. If you take a small number up on top divided by a bottom number that's large, you will end up with a small number and you'll mainly have reactants. So you may ask yourself, what is considered a large value? What's considered a small value? It is that large value of one basically <laughs> is our large value. So anything above one is considered large when we talk about equilibrium constants. Anything less than one is considered a small value. So as I just mentioned there, <clears throat> if we have a K value that is larger than one, is considered a large value of K, it would mean that we should mainly have products when we reach equilibrium. And we, the equilibrium would lie to the right, especially if you have a really large value, it would mean essentially the reaction is going kind of from reactants to products. Opposite is true if we had, again, a really small value of K, less than one. What that means is we should end up with a lot of reactants when we reach equilibrium. And essentially the reaction is kind of going from products to reactants in that particular case. Any questions on that? So K is just a number, no units associated with it. And 
it does tell us a, a good amount of information. One important aspect of what the actual number tells us is if we ran this particular reaction, you know, based on the equilibrium value, would we expect to produce a lot of products when it sort of hits equilibrium? Or would we expect to have a lot of reactants when we hit equilibrium? And this is important information because it does sort of determine in certain calculations we'll do later on this sort of semester, you know, how you should approach, you know, some of these calculations. So you want to kind of keep that stuff in mind. Any questions on that? All right, so here, if we look at this reaction, it looks like we got Mickey plus a couple of circles, gives us other circles, upside down Mickey. Uh, the K value here is 25, so take a moment here. At equilibrium, would you expect mainly reactants or products in this particular case? So, this is again really the only sort of piece of information you need in a question like this. We do see that K is equal to 25. And based on what we've been talking about, that the large value of K is basically anything over one, this would, this would basically be considered a large value of K. And we would expect a reaction to head towards the product side and we would expect mainly products at this point. Again, just the basic products divided by reactants, large number divided by a small number should give us a large number for K. And again, that's why we would expect our products in this case. So I saw some answer there in the chat box. So that looks good, very good. Questions on that particular one? Okay. All right. So. Let's talk a little bit about homogeneous equilibrium. And <clears throat> homogeneous equilibrium, homogeneous is the same as what you probably talked about with homogeneous mixtures. Homogeneous means the same throughout, right? In terms of mixtures. And when we talk about homogeneous equilibrium, we're talking about phases. In this particular case, everybody here is gases. And that means that everybody's in the same phase. And if we wrote our equilibrium expression, we would take our products over our reactants like we saw in the previous slide. And that would give us our NO2 again squared because of the coefficient divided by the concentration of N2O4. As I mentioned earlier, this is sometimes referred to as KC, C meaning concentration. So we would use something like molarity here if we were doing some type of calculation. But because these are gases, we sometimes think about gases, we oftentimes think about pressures associated with gases. Gases as well, gas law, something like PV equals NRT, right? Ideal gas law. P is pressure, V is volume, N is R, N is moles, R is the gas constant, and uh, T is our temperature. Reminder, right, that unit-wise pressure here should be in atmospheres. Volume should be in liters, N should be moles, temperature should be Kelvin, and R is 0 0.08206 right? liters, atmosphere, Kelvin, mole, right, is R, gas constant. So since these are all gases, sometimes when we do experiments, you know, and they're gases, it's oftentimes easier to follow pressures. And we can do pressures here and we could do an equilibrium constant involves pressures. And it would be done the same way as products over reactants. We still use the coefficient just like we've done before. And this would be the partial pressure squared, again, the squared because of the coefficient of NO2 divided by the partial pressure of N2O4. This K value where we use pressures is what is sometimes referred to as KP, P being P for pressure in this particular case. In general, um, especially later on when we do some equilibrium calculations, when we're dealing with pressures, atmosphere is usually standard pressure, right? So that's usually the unit. If you're doing anything with sort of pressure, especially in equilibrium calculations, not necessarily what we're going to kind of see here, but later on as well, uh, you want to make sure that usually um, your units are in atmospheres when you're doing some type of 
equilibrium calculation. A reminder, other units that you probably have seen before, tor, millimeters of mercury, maybe bar, pas kilopascals, all those kind of things. Uh, these are other units. And in most cases, anything involving equilibrium calculation, especially later on in the chapter, make sure it's in atmospheres. Make sure it's in atmospheres, even if they give you the the pressures in say millimeters of mercury or tor and they ask you to give the answer in millimeters mercury or millimeters of mercury or tor um, you do have to kind of do the calculation part in atmospheres and convert at the end so that's something to keep in mind especially later on when we talk about sort of ice tables and doing those type of problems so you want to make sure you kind of do it that way so kc is basically the equilibrium constant involving it calculated with concentrations molarity Kp is equilibrium concentration calculated using partial pressures. They do not usually equal the same value, but they do tell you the same thing. So if you have a large value of Kp, that means you mainly have products. That means those products are probably the ones contributing to the pressure because you probably have a lot of pressure if you have a lot of gases on that side. And if you have a small value of Kp, same thing, you probably have more reactants than products when it reaches equilibrium. Now, sometimes you can maybe only calculate Kc based on the information given to you, but you want the Kp value or vice versa. So there is a way that you could go from one to the other, and it is this equation here. You do need to know it. And that is Kp is equal to Kc times Rt delta N. So Kp is our equilibrium constant for pressure. Uh, Kc is our equilibrium constant for concentration. R is our gas constant, which is this guy here. Or if you want to use the rounded ones, a lot of people do is this one, right? T is our temperature in Kelvin, just like sort of in gas laws. So you want to make sure it's in Kelvin. And delta N is the change in the number of moles of gases that are present. And that is basically the moles of product minus the moles of reactant. And it's really important that you do it correctly in that sense for delta N. So for example, um, if we had this equation here, 2A goes to B, delta N in this case would be one minus two, which means it's negative one. And it may not seem like that negative is important, but it is important mathematically here because if you did RT to the negative one, that is different math than doing RT to the one. So sometimes people just take the difference and go, oh, the difference is one. They ignore the negative part of it, but really important here to not ignore it. Otherwise, mathematically, you will get the wrong answer, obviously. Once you take negative one, that's one over something, right? So the one is just basically the same thing. So you wanna make sure that you just don't take the difference of it and discard the negative part of it because mathematically here, um, you will end up with the wrong answer. The good thing is since mostly this obviously has no units associated with it, this has no units associated with it. You don't have to worry too much about these things in terms of units. The only difference is you wanna make sure again, temperature wise Kelvin because ultimately it's gonna be canceling out with the Kelvin that's there. Any questions on that? So that's a nice way that you could kind of go from Kc to Kp, depending on sort of what information is given to you, it allows you sort of that flexibility to calculate one from the other. Again, they're ultimately both just equilibrium constants. They tell you the same thing. Either you have mainly products, mainly reactants when this thing reaches equilibrium. Any questions on that particular one? Okay. Um, that, the equation Kp equals Kc times Rt, and then the, um, is that a constant that we can use for like for different problems and whatnot? Then? Yeah, so you would, you would wanna use this and we're gonna do a couple of examples coming up, but you would wanna do or use this equation uh, in a situation where maybe uh, you were asked to calculate the Kp value, but all they give you is maybe uh, concentrations of everybody. So because they give you only concentrations, you can't directly calculate the Kp value because you don't have any pressures but it will allow you to calculate the Kc value. And then you could use this equation here, our formula, and use it to figure out what the Kp value would be in that particular case. 
other questions on that? All right, so in our homogeneous equilibrium, if we look at this and we uh, write our equilibrium expression like we've been talking about, uh, we would take our products of our reactants. So that would give us some acetate times some H3O plus divided by acetic acid and water. Now the concentration of water really doesn't change throughout the um, sort of experiment or reaction. It remains relatively constant. So typically speaking, if we were to write the equilibrium expression for this, we actually would leave water out and water would not be found in an equilibrium expression because it is constant. And I'll just get rid of this part of it. It confuses people sometimes, don't worry about it. So right here should be the proper equilibrium expression for this reaction. Again, our products divided by our reactants we do not include water because it's in, it is basically going to remain constant. In general, when you're writing the equilibrium expression, anything that has a pure liquid next to it or that is a solid pretty much are not included. So anything with a liquid or a solid not included in the equilibrium expression, that really does just leave you two things that are included as we'll see. It's basically things that are aqueous and things that are gas. These two guys are included in the equilibrium expression. So if you come across an equation and you see an S or an L next to something, you shouldn't include it in your expression. You should leave it out. It basically remains constant. It doesn't change throughout the reaction and um, only basically aqueous and gases should be involved. By the way, while we're talking a little bit about this, just in case there's any type of misunderstanding about the difference between say a liquid and something that's aqueous, there is a difference between these two things. Liquid is something that's a pure liquid, like if you just had water by itself, nothing else mixing it, that is a liquid. If you have something that's aqueous, you could take something like water, which is a liquid, add something to it like sodium chloride, and you get a sodium chloride solution, right? And that's aqueous. So aqueous basically means that you took something and you dissolved it in a solvent like water, and you made basically a solution. So there is a difference between L and AQ, but anything with an L or an S basically not included in your equilibrium expression, you should leave them out. And for the most part, as we'll see, as we go through calculations, you should ignore them as well. That way you don't get the wrong answer along the way. Any questions on that? <clears throat> I have one. I yeah. was just wondering what the apostrophe on the K apostrophe C, what did that denote the apostrophe? It, it denoted the way they kind of wrote this slide, the textbook when they made it is uh, if we were just to uh, kind of write our equilibrium expression like we normally would products over reactants, we would include the water, but basically because the water is constant, um, it's not included. And that's actually what I, I, I kind of scribbled over here. They would take the K apostrophe and times it by the water because it's constant. And that water and the water here would cancel out and you'd be left with the actual equilibrium constant. So you don't really have to worry about the apostrophe here. It's just sort of a, they were kind of showing you stepwise that if you just did the equilibrium expression like we've been talking about, products over reactants, you get this guy, but because water is constant, it ends up uh, canceling out and reducing down to the true equilibrium constant that's here. So for the most part, you don't have to put an apostrophe on anything or you won't really worry about it. It was just sort of the way they, they wrote this slide. So okay, thank you. You're welcome. We take the product over the reactant and then we don't put H2O in the equation, right? Uh, I kind of missed the first part, but I think I caught it. Uh, so if we wrote the equilibrium expression here, it would be products over reactants like we talked about. So it would be the concentration of the acetate, which is the CH3CO minus times the H3O plus divided by reactants, which would be the acetic acid. And we would not include the water because it's a pure liquid. So the one that's in the box right there in the center, if you were to write the equilibrium expression, this guy in this box, this is the correct expression right here without the water included. If we had something else that wasn't water and it was liquid, will we still not include it? 
Yes, you would not include it. So anything with a, a symbol that is L would not be included. Anything with a symbol that has an S, as we'll see a little bit later on, will not be included either. It really has no effect on the equilibrium because they really remain constant. They really don't do much in that sense, uh, especially liquids. Uh, their concentrations are relatively high, so they don't change as a result of the reaction. So they're not really sort of participating in it, if you will. And as we'll see a little bit later on, solids are just kind of sitting there. So they also are not really sort of participating in anything. So we don't include those things. Uh, we really just want to include in our equilibrium expression sort of the things that are participating in the reaction that's taking place uh, that has some type of effect on the reaction that's taking place. Now, if you did have water that was in the gas state, it would participate and you would include it because a gas is something that would be included. So in that equilibrium expression, and that's because a gas is very different. It's moving around, it's participating, it's interacting, and um, as opposed to our liquid water. All right, so why don't you try some here? Why don't you write both the KC and KP if possible? for the following ones to see what you come up with and we'll talk about it. So write both expressions if you can, or just one if you can't and see what you come up with. See what we got going on here. All right, so for the first one there, again, if we're going to uh, write, uh, we would take our KC would be our concentration of our products, which would be NO2. Again, we would take it to the fourth because of the coefficient that's present uh, times the concentration of O2. That would be divided by a reactant, uh, which in this case would be the concentration of N2O5. We would also want to square it because of the coefficient that's present. In this particular case here, we got gases sort of happening all the way through. So we can write a Kp value, our expression for this going to look exactly the same, except that it's going to be the partial pressure of NO2 also again to the fourth times the partial pressure of O2 divided by the partial pressure squared of N2O5. Any questions on that one there? B, uh, looking at B, we would do our KC, which would be our product, which would be H3O plus times our F minus divided by our HF. And here the water would not be included as it is a pure liquid. Also, there's no gases present in that particular one, so it makes it hard to do a... Uh, Kp for that one since there's no pressures involved or gases involved. So obviously you could not do a Kp for that particular one. Any questions on how to write these um, expressions? I have a question. Yeah. I kind of missed the part. Is the P to the power of four or is the entire thing to the power of four for Kp? Uh, for the Kp, it is uh, the NO2 part of it would be to the power of four. So for example, if you actually had a, a pressure for that particular one, mm -hmm. say the pressure was 0.2, you would want to take 0.2 to, to the fourth power when you do the math part of it. Mm -hmm. So it's just for the, specifically the NO2 because the coefficient on NO2 is four. Thank you. Yep, other questions? All right, so why don't we try one with a calculation here. The equilibrium concentrations uh, for the reaction between carbon uh, monoxide and Cl2 um, is the following. Calculate the Kc and Kp. So we're looking for two different answers here. You're looking to calculate the Kc value and the Kp value. So why don't you take a moment here and try to calculate both of those. And we'll go over them and make sure everybody hopefully got it. Okay, so, uh, we're actually given some equilibrium concentrations. Um, so we have the equilibrium concentrations of everybody here. That really does mean that we could go right after the Kc value in this case, because we do have all the concentrations. So we would want to start with our Kc expression and our Kc would be, again, our products divided by our reactants. 
And since these are equilibrium concentrations, we basically could just put those numbers in. So it looks like it's 0 0.14 for our product. Uh, we have 0 0.012 and 0 0.054 in this particular case. And if we do all that good stuff there, we end up, I think, with something like 216, if you want to do correct sig figs, which you probably should shoot for, like a 220 on that. Again, everybody's two sig figs all the way through here. So probably take that to a 220 as our value for the KC value in this case. Any questions on the first part there? Um, why did you round it up to one, uh, 220? I did uh, for significant figure wise, since this is, oh yeah. So uh, basically we're multiplying and dividing here. So everybody's got two sig figs. So probably the correct answer would be 220 based on sort of sig figs. Again, in case you forgot about all that, then you probably ended up with 216 is what you get on your calculator. I think 216 and some change. Other questions on that? Okay, uh, so, and again, the reason we took this approach is because we were given concentrations. We had nothing to do with pressures at this point. So we had no way to go into KP first. So now that we have the KC, we can use that formula that we saw earlier, which basically relates both of them together. And this will allow us to go from our KC value to our KP value. We do need to figure out a couple of things. First off, Delta N is our moles of gas. So on our product side, we have one. On our reactant side, we have one there and one more there is two gas molecules. So that's going to give us a delta N of again, negative one. So the negative important as we talked about. Uh, R is a constant. So R is our gas constant, our 0 0.08206. Or again, you can use the two one if you want. The other thing that we need to do is temperature here. So we do need to convert it into Kelvin. So our temperature, like a 273 plus a 74, that looks like maybe a 347 on the Kelvin. I think at that point, that's everything we need. So KP would equal R. And again, we use our 220 from above and our R and RT, and again to the negative one. Um, probably looking at about a 7.7 .7 in terms of that. If you uh, if you maybe use the 216, you maybe got 7.6, uh, somewhere in that ballpark as well. And that would be our KP value. Question on either of those calculations. Now, uh, it does show us what we talked about earlier. The value of KC and the value of KP are not identical to each other, so they don't equal the same thing. But they do tell us sort of the same thing. They are both considered large values of K. At 220, that's a large value, and at 7.7, .7, that also is a large value of K, which means we would mainly expect mainly products to be present uh, when this reaction reaches equilibrium. Any questions on where any of the numbers came from, why we did it? I'm sorry? Could you repeat the last part that you said about we mainly have products remaining? Yeah, so uh, because both K values sort of agree in that sense, they're both considered large values of K. When the system reaches equilibrium, we would uh, mainly expect to have products present. So that COCL2 would be present and probably would be in most cases the major contributor to the pressure in that equilibrium as well, we would probably see. Other questions? Uh, Professor, where did you get delta N, the one minus two? So N in this case, the delta N is the number of moles of gas molecules uh -huh. that are present. So it's basically products, products uh, minus reactants. So on the product side, there's just one gas molecule, which is where this came from. And then there's one gas molecule on the reactant and one more here. So that's two gas molecules on the reactant side. So products minus reactants in that particular case. Thank you. You're welcome. Other questions? Uh, professor? Yeah. Uh, should we wait and uh, round up the KC till the end so we could get a better exact number? Yeah, I'll be honest with you. I don't know how, 
let me say this, I guess, correctly. Uh, it is a chemistry class. You should always try to get the right number of sig figs. Um, but you know, if you, if you missed it by one or something like that, um, it'd probably be okay. Personally, uh, to sort of answer specifically your question, uh, like usual, I, I usually don't round too much until the very, very end, kind of clean it up at the end, personally, as if I was going through all this. So probably to be truthfully honest with you, if I went through, I probably would have round through with the 216 to get to the KP number. If that was sort of, you know, um, what I was looking for, I probably would have continued on with my calculation if I was just looking at the KP. So like normal, probably you've, you've done before, you, you probably want to hold off on a lot of rounding until the very end. But you know, if you were really interested in both the KC and KP value, like we are here, you may want to kind of go back and just make sure you know, you know, everybody got to the right number of sig figs. Probably more so in this class, um, you know, uh, getting the calculation probably right is kind of more what I'm looking at. And clearly, like I said before, you should kind of try to do everybody to the right sig figs. Um, but if you miss it, you know, by one or something like that. It's not going to be a big issue. The only issue you would have probably with sig figs in this class, uh, tremendous issue is you gave like thousand number of sig figs. Like I've had people, you know, give an answer and then like they flip the page over and it's like on the back, I just keep going with all the decimal places. So um, if you round kind of correctly and you know go crazy and every answer has 400 sig figs, you know, you'll probably be okay on that in terms of that. Other questions on that? Okay. So I, I think what we'll do is uh, we'll lay it up here for lecture. We do have lab today and it is activity one, which is an Excel sort of excitement. Since we didn't get a lot of lecturing done on uh, the first day, I think what we're gonna do is we're gonna do a little bit of lecturing at the beginning and uh, we might just take a little break and then uh, we'll talk about sort of the Excel and then we'll come back and you could work on that sort of assignment. So there's no pre-lab, again, a reminder, no pre-lab um, for this activity one. I think the very first one, that has a pre-lab associated with it is experiment two, which is what we're doing on Wednesday. And I moved that experiment two pre-lab to the a week from today, just to give everybody a little bit extra time uh, to kind of get your send gauge stuff uh, together. Um, so that's the very first one that should have a pre-lab is the one we're gonna do on Wednesday. So today is activity one, Excel, but I think that's what we're gonna do. We'll lecture for a little bit uh, and then uh, we'll take a to the maybe break to stand up and then we'll come back and we'll talk about the uh, activity and the Excel and all that kind of stuff. Sound good? All right. Make sure you put it here if you haven't done so in the chat and then I'll see everybody in about 15 minutes. Yeah. Come through the lab.